Welcome to On Contact. Today we sit down and discuss the Israeli arms industry with journalist Rania Holland. It's important to understand the reason that Israel does, is able to sell so many arms around the world, is because it has a population of people who are captive, Palestinians, um, and sometimes its neighbors, to test these products on. On Contact. On Contact. On Chris Hedges. The Israeli arms industry, which signed contracts last year for global arms deals worth $5.7 billion, routinely tests new and experimental weapons on the Palestinians living under Israeli occupation. Its multi-billion dollar homeland security industry, in the name of counterterrorism, has provided training to hundreds of police departments in the United States. Israel's brutal crowd control tactics and weapons are now used on the streets of American inner cities. Three months after the Ferguson uprising, the St. Louis Police Department started stockpiling the Israeli-produced skunk spray, a foul-smelling liquid developed by Israel to break up Palestinian demonstrations. Sixty percent of global drone exports come from Israel, making Israel the single largest source of drone proliferation in the world. The Kalanit and Hatsav tank shells that detonate in midair, blanketing populated areas with deadly bomblets, were first used on the Palestinians in Gaza and then sold on the world market. RT correspondent Anya Parampel looks at the global reach of the Israeli arms and security industry in the massive worldwide arms market. This week, the U.S. delivered two F-35 fighter jets to Israel. The $100 million planes are just a window into the 10-year, $38 billion arms deal between the U.S. and Israel. But Israel's own contributions to the wider international war market are often overlooked. Earlier this year, the Israeli government announced its defense companies had signed export deals totaling $5.7 billion in 2015. In 2014, Israel shared a partial list of recipient countries. The United States was on the list, as was Spain, the United Kingdom, Kenya, and South Korea. The Defense Ministry provided a bit more insight about the sales in 2012, the peak year for Israel's arms exports. It says it sold $3.8 billion in weapons to Asian states in the Pacific, $1.7 billion to Europe, and $1.1 billion to the U.S. Meanwhile, they sold $604 million worth of weapons to African nations and $107 million worth of equipment to Latin American countries. But digging deeper into the shadows of Israel's arms export industry, you find India. According to IHS Jane's tracking, India was Israel's leading arms customer in 2015. The two countries have made around $10 billion worth of arms deals since the turn of the century. Just last year, Israel sold 10 Heron armed drones to India for $400 million. And while Israel has attempted to keep secret its arming of the Rwandan government in the 90s when a genocide was taking place in the country, a confidential UN report confirmed European and Israeli weapons have kept the deadly conflict in South Sudan alive, a conflict which has trickled down to the roiling war in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where Israeli weapons have also been found after being sold to Uganda. Israel is notoriously secretive when it comes to who exactly it sells its war toys to, begging the question what exactly it has to hide. Today I'm joined by Rania Halleck, an independent journalist who focuses on the underclass and marginalized, especially the plight of the Palestinians. Her work has appeared at Al Jazeera, The Nation, Salon, The Intercept, and more. She is also co-host of the weekly podcast, Unauthorized Disclosure. Thank you, Rania. Thanks for having me on. So, I want to talk about Israel as one of the major arms producers. This is from Aret, sales to Europe grew from 724 million in 2004 to 1.63 billion. It is a huge industry. Perhaps you can talk a little bit about it. Yeah, so Israel's a really small country. I think it's relatively the size of New Jersey, uh, but it ranks among the top 10 arms exporters in the world. I mean, that's a really impressive. And 60% of drones, which I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, it's the producer of 60% of uh, drones worldwide. It's the single largest um, 
exporter of drones. It, I believe Israel has exported drones to more than 50 countries um, around the world. It, uh, in fact, in some cases, it's exported drones to both sides of a given conflict. So in places like India and Pakistan, it's actually fueled like a drone's arms race. Uh, but yes, I mean, it's really, it's shocking because Israel is such a small country. And it's important to understand the reason that Israel does, is able to sell so many arms around the world, is because it has a population of people who are captive, Palestinians, um, and sometimes its neighbors, to test these products right. and, on. And that's what they do. Yeah. So perhaps you can talk about how that works, both within the occupied territories like Gaza and in southern Lebanon. So the drone, for example, um, Gaza is a place where that's tested. I, th I would actually call Gaza like a laboratory for weapons of mass destruction. And, and, and we should be clear that Gaza is an, virtually an open-air prison. People cannot get in or out. They are trapped. Uh, there is collective punishment carried out in violation of international law. Uh, what's the number now of people in Gaza? What's the, it's almost two million. It's almost two million now. Yeah, almost, uh, it, it's moving up to that level. So, I mean, so explain how that works. So Gaza has been under siege, like you said, for almost ten. I believe it's like ten years now, and um, and people there have basically no rights. And every couple of years or so, there's these periodic slaughters that Israel they carries call out. They the lawn. Right. Um, actually, you know, the last time around, the U.S. military personnel who operated in Iraq called it removing the topsoil. So oh, it went beyond it? mowing oh, the lawn. Yeah, and so d during these periodic slaughters, uh, the last one was in 2014. And we should be clear then that when they will go after Gaza, which are often encounters that Israel will orchestrate by violating a Cease particular fire. ceasefire agreement. Yeah. And the reason they call it mowing the lawn is to kind of keep Gaza in crisis at a subsistence level. But then when they attack, they will use industrial weapons, whether it's artillery, tank shells, 1,000-pound uh, iron fragmentation bombs. I've been in Gaza when it's been attacked by the Israeli Air Force, um, mechanized units. And we should be clear that in Gaza, there is no army, no navy, no air force, no command and control, no mechanized units. It's slaughter. And as you point out, they will then test these new weapons systems as they did in southern Lebanon. So explain some of the systems they've tried out against the defenseless population in Gaza. Well, in 2014, they used bunker buster bombs in Gaza, uh, some of which were supplied by the United States. Uh, they also used their own um, bombs. There's a, a company and is that was partly it was partly owned by the Israeli government called Israel Military Industries that was actually on the verge of bankruptcy before the uh, the war on Gaza in 2014 and the war actually like brought it back to life uh, because of all the ammunition it was able to sell and these 500 pound bombs it was able Are you talking about the 2008 no, 2014. Oh, this the is in 2014. 2014. Oh, this yeah, was the last. The last time around, and then Elbit Systems, one of Israel's largest military exporters, uh, it makes everything from you know border patrol or border security technology to drone technology to actual bombs. Uh, their stocks rose to the highest level that they had been in years uh, because of the. Uh, because investors were, you know, predicting that their products were going to sell really well, and they did. And well, they, they, don't they? I mean, there were they. They had a, a shell. I think it was a tank shell that exploded in midair that they were testing on Gaza, and then they market this as as battle tested and combat proven. Combat proven. And this is a huge selling point on the international market mm. for arms sales. I mean, it's huge. Like this, this makes a huge difference, and all of Israel's products across the board are sold like this. Whether it's whether it's you know border security fencing or bombs, it's it's always combat tested and battle proven, and that's like a, a you know that's like a seal of approval uh, for for buyers. And in, in fact, after the Gaza war in 2014, like within Let's three weeks, war. or yeah, I guess slaughter. <laughs> I should call it a slaughter. But after the one-sided slaughter in Gaza in 2014, uh, three weeks after, Israel held its annual drone conference, and many of the technologies that were used in Gaza for the first time were uh, bragged about two international sellers uh, that were there to like look at all these different systems. And so, and there's also something to recognize too is that with Israel, there's a reason that Israel's able to do this. One, it's because Palestinians basically have no rights. So right. they're a captive population. And, and to, they have no international protection. Exactly. And to a certain extent, they, they are able to do the same thing to southern Lebanon whenever they attack there. But beyond that, it's the fact that Israel's entire economy is built around um, advancing its ideology of you know maximizing as much land as it can. Um, 
with as few Palestinians on it as possible. And so if that's the whole, um, if that's the whole driving force behind your economy, then everything is shaped around that. Then basically it just gives rise to an industries. Um, and so Israel becomes this repression factory. It's a startup nation. Many of the startups that it, it launches are based around controlling people, warehousing people. Um, and you know, uh, and bombing people, <laughs> and so that's why it's able to be one of the top sellers of these kinds of technologies around the world. Well, the whole with the rise of the quote-unquote war on terror, this has been a gift to the Israeli security or arms establishment. And one of the things you've written extensively about is how, as we have militarized our police forces, Israeli tactics. And even Israeli weapons have infiltrated into the streets of places like Ferguson. Yeah, so since 9 11, virtually every major U.S. police department and many small ones have. I think that, 200, right? Yeah, it's, I, that's, I mean, that's an estimate. Like, right. we actually don't even know, but they've, many police departments across the country have sent senior level commanders to Israel on uh, trips to basically train with the Israeli military, Israeli border police, Israeli, you know, national police, to meet with Mossad agents, to meet, you know, to receive briefings. Um, and they end up adopting some of what they learn and bringing it back to the United States. And these trips are facilitated oftentimes by organizations like the ADL and APAC. Um, now, these are Israeli lobby groups. Right, right exactly. Now. Exactly. There's, I mean, the relationships are so close to the point where, um, and this, this fit in really well with the idea of the war on terror in this country. And you mentioned, you know, the militarization of police. The, you know, Israel's uh, role in helping protect, perpetuate that, obviously, it's not the sole reason behind the militarization of police, but its role is virtually ignored in the mainstream press. But it's happening. I mean, all the time you see these press releases out about Israeli. Um, about you know several U.S. police departments sending their police chiefs to Israel, and they bring what they learn back. And a couple, there are a couple examples of this. Um, in New York City, there was the demographics unit, and that was largely uh, influenced and modeled off of the way that Israel treats Palestinians in the West Bank. Great. When we come back, we'll hear more from independent journalist Rania Halek. <laughs> On Contact, On Contact, with Chris Hedges. Welcome back to On Contact. We'll continue our conversation with independent journalist Rania Halek. So we were speaking about these police chiefs, police officials who go to Israel for training, bring back Israeli tactics to the streets of American cities. But you've also written that there's an ideological component. What is that? So when you have police officers, a civilian police force, going to a country like Israel to learn from their military uh, how to occupy people, that's what they're going to learn. That's what the Israeli military well, does. That, that's what they do in our inner cities with poor people of color, of course. Well, exactly. And they're basically bringing that mentality back with them um, and applying it here. Uh, and so Palestinians are these people who are basically, I mean, it's Israel. So part of it is also trying to sell the occupation as really a law and order issue. So Palestinians aren't occupied people, right? They're just a bunch of criminals um, that need to be controlled, um, and you know, and, and that need to like have law and order imposed on them. And at the same time, you have U.S. police officers coming back to this country, a thinking Zionism's great, and then b all also applying tactics of occupation to poor populations that they already you know use these tactics on. But now it's in a more efficient way because Israel does have a very efficient system of control. And so that's, I mean, that's a part of it. A part of it is just kind of churning out uh, pro-Israel supporters within the police mm. departments in this country. And it's been quite effective it in has. cities like Atlanta. In Atlanta and, um, and especially in New York City. I mean, New York City probably has one of the closest relationships as well as in L.A., the LAPD and Israel are best buddies. Uh, but, and then, but then there's also ways they're bringing these back. So I mentioned the demographics unit in New York City. And then there's also a, a more recent example is um, the St. Louis Police Department. It, three months after Ferguson, the Ferguson uprising took place, the St. Louis Police Department, which has also sent people to Israel before, started stockpiling skunk spray. Explain what that is. So skunk spray is this liquid, uh, this liquid crowd control mechanism that is sprayed on 
uh, people in Palestine. It's only ever been used on Palestinians. And it smells awful. It smells like rotting animal flesh and hum human feces and a number of other awful things. Um, and it sticks to your skin and your hair and the, the odor um, and your, your walls, because sometimes Israel will spray it on homes. It sticks to that for days. You can't wash it off. You can't scrub it off. Uh, so basically, it's it's... In a way, it's humiliating, um, but Israel has, it was developed by the Israeli police department, and so a lot of times on these police department trips, when they go to Israel, it also offers a free marketing opportunity to Israeli companies to sell their products to U.S. police departments. And with skunk spray, which has still not been used on American streets, there are other police departments that have also suggested they're interested in procuring it. Perhaps they already have. And so at some point, you know, you shouldn't be surprised if you see it used against protesters in some inner city. <laughs> One of the things that always surprised us, and I covered the first and the second intifada, was the propensity on the part of the Israeli military and police to use lethal force against unarmed demonstrators, which, of course, we are again seeing within marginal communities in the United States. Yeah, and I mean, there's no way to actually like link the two, but you can imagine that if U.S. police are going over, you know, to the West Bank, which they have been, even as, you know, one human rights organization after another says Israel is summarily executing Palestinians um, for, you know, having knives on them, which is what we're seeing now. I think something like over 200 have been killed since last October. Uh, when you have U.S. police departments going there, we already have a serious problem in this country with shootings of unarmed people, particularly black people. And so that's only going to confound the problem when you've got people learning from Israel. And, uh, you know, there's also the fact that, the, you know, obviously it's different because Israel is a more explicit occupation. Um, it's not as clear, depending on where you live in the United States. Well, if you're black and poor, it's pretty clear. Right. It depends geographically you where you live. in Baltimore, it's pretty clear. <laughs> exactly. So you, but, but you do have these zones where, I mean, in a way, Palestine is a place where, especially the West Bank, um, where people are being warehoused in sort of like different enclaves. Right. And we should be clear that in the West Bank, what Israel has done is, in essence, create pod-like entities which are surrounded by Jewish settlements, military roads which means that at the flick of a switch, they can isolate pockets right. of Palestinians. And in a lot of ways, that is kind of similar in a less obvious way of what you see in places like Baltimore, where there are parts of the city where you know they are kind of surrounded. It's like these abandoned areas that are people just being warehoused, uh, poor, the poorest people in the country being warehoused. And so uh, there, there's just this sharing of mentality. And I also should emphasize that it's not just um, the U.S. going, sending its officers to Israel. Every once in a while, it goes the other way around, too. So in Atlanta, there's a Georgia uh, police exchange program where every year they send Georgia police to Israel, but every other year they send Israeli police come and visit the Atlanta area to learn uh, tactics from the war on drugs. So it's kind of, there, there is like a, you know, back and forth here where you've got these kind of two oppressors working together. And that's part of the reason that you see a lot of people from both of these sides, whether it's black people, you know, there's the Black Lives Matter um, groups in the United States allying with Palestinians because they recognize that there is a tangible, material way that their oppressors are working together, and it only makes sense for them to be working together as well. One of the things Israel has done quite effectively is build a very sophisticated security and surveillance network in terms of tapping into phones um, and monitoring the 24 hours a day activities, especially of people they consider to be militants among the Palestinians. Perhaps you can talk about that, which is also carried over. Yeah, so this is um, something that Israel's ramped up in recent years, especially with the monitoring of social media. You see a lot of Palestinians being jailed for what they're saying on Facebook. Uh, and Israel's starting to shut down Facebook pages of Palestinians. It feels are inciting. Well, they also have the phone lines tapped. Right, well, they've, I mean, they have everything tapped. And there's also, there's, so there's a couple things happening right now with Israel's using the issue of ISIS and the desire of the U.S. government to want to, and the EU as well, to want to crack down on social media to sort of sell the products that they use uh, to monitor Palestinians in that way. But then there's also the connection with the NSA, right, where um, Israel, I mean, the U.S. government basically feeds Israel information uh, from Americans that's collected on Americans uh, unfiltered, um, and Israel's able to use that. And then there's a couple Israeli. How do they use it? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know. I assume, I mean, there's Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans who go and travel there. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you could, it's all, you know, speculation, but you could, you know, speculate that they're probably, you know, using it to hold things against people, Palestinian Americans. Well, <laughs> our, 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 wouldn't, wouldn't it be fair to say, especially with the massive amounts of money, and I spoke to Miko Pellet not long ago, that is coming into the United States 
to stop the boycott, divestment, and sanctions Absolutely. movements, to monitor Palestinian activists within universities and communities that they have raw data given to them by the United States about these people. Absolutely. I mean, it makes sense that, that would be, that's what they would be doing. And they've said they have the IDF, they have allocated millions of dollars devoted to monitoring BDS activists around the world, including in the United States. So absolutely, there could be a situation where Israel is absolutely like using this this, um, this information on Americans that's unfiltered and given to them by the U.S. government to spy on American BDS activists. Absolutely. Uh, but, I mean, there's just, there's an, I mean, there's a number of ways that this, um, that this could backfire. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, nobody wants to investigate or look into it. I mean, you just don't see any mainstream attention paid to any of these things whatsoever. How could it backfire? Well, it could backfire because you, ha you have Israel, that give you, you're giving Israel the ability to spy on American citizens. Right. And I mean, Israel well, we've already known that. does we've known this. this for a while, right. right? And nobody seems to care. And Israel already, and even I mean, look what they do to Palestinians. They use Palestinian like things that are happening in their personal lives against them to recruit right. informants. Oh, that's and very common. They could be, you know, who knows? They could be intimidating Americans as well. I mean, they, they have a, if they have the access to this kind of information, your personal life, you know, um, if you're an American activist. And so, I mean, there's so many ways that it could backfire in terms of free speech for Americans. How fused? are now the security and surveillance establishments in Israel and the United States. I mean, they really, they work hand in hand. Even though Israel aggressively spies on the United States and you know steals the U.S. technology for its own military purposes, um, I think it's one of the most aggressive states in terms of like, it's spying apparatus on the U.S., even among you know adversarial states, one of the most aggressive. Uh, but so why does it do that? Uh, because the United, well, it likes to, you know, it likes to, use U.S. technologies for its own military purposes so it can sell, you know, so it can advance its own weapons um, and agenda. And also there's, I mean, I believe there's been times where Israel has sent, you know, information about U.S. technologies to other countries like China before. Uh, so, you know, it's not exactly the best ally. Um, but that said, the U.S. has a very, the U.S. security apparatus and the Israeli security apparatus, they really do work hand in hand. And the U.S. takes so many cues from things that Israel starts. Um, one of those things that one of those things is like the targeted assassination. Right. Israel Important basically point. invented that, uh, that the whole framework around that. They oh, didn't, didn't Obama refer to an Israeli Supreme Court decision to justify? Uh, was it targeted assassination? Right. Is that correct? Well, yeah, yeah. There was a legal memo that came out about his justification for killing Anwar Awlaki, an American citizen in Yemen, with a drone. And the justification behind that, part of it, was using Israeli Supreme Court president that said it was okay to, tar to launch targeted assassinations against Palestinian militants, um, or people believed were Palestinian militants in Gaza. And so, yeah, you see the U.S. taking cues. I mean, in the CIA report as well, the CIA torture report that the Senate put out a couple years ago, it also cited Israeli Supreme Court president uh, for justifying torture. <laughs> so Israel oftentimes does serve as like the sort of, you know, the first one to do these really well, awful we, we things. We saw torture techniques used in Abu Ghraib that were taught by the Israelis. Yeah, and I mean, I think one of them they call the Palestinian chair, yes, literally. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Let's talk about this arms deal. So what is it, $38 billion over a 10-year period, uh, increasing uh, arms sales to Israel. What does that, what does that mean? Why did that happen? Um, I don't know. I guess the Palestinians are have to be sacrificed for Obama's legacy. But, I mean, the, there's a couple things in this deal that are a little different than the usual deals. First of all, it's the largest military right. aid package in the history of the United States, literally. But beyond that, um, this deal is a little bit different because in the past, about, I think, 25 or 26 percent of the weapons that Israel is able to buy with U.S. aid uh, were able to come from Israeli industries. And so this time around, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be slowly moved out where you have to buy only all U.S. weapons. And so it's just a huge boon for the U.S. Um, for the U.S. defense industry. <laughs> so they're very excited about this because Israel has to purchase $38 billion in their products over the next uh, 10 years. But beyond that, I mean, this deal is basically giving Israel the opportunity to spend the next 10 years occupying and brutalizing Palestinians. Right. It's like guaranteed with impunity because there's absolutely no conditions, again, attached whatsoever. In terms of the use of the weapons. Right. Well, in terms of the use of the weapons and also the fact that Israel, I mean, is still engaged in occupation, still building settlements. Well, we, we used to pick up still. bomb fragments after the Israelis bombed in Gaza and it would say made in Dayton, Ohio. How? <laughs> I mean, you can imagine the kind of message that sends to people in Gaza. Of course. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. That was independent journalist Rania Halek. 
Palestinians, like poor people of color in the United States, are viewed in the neoliberal order as disposable. Those Palestinians trapped in Gaza, or the ringed ghettos in the occupied West Bank, live in what Israel sees as little more than a human laboratory to test its crowd control methods and weapons. The use of blunt military force against unarmed civilians, a central feature of the oppression of the Palestinians by Israel, has spread to the United States. We, like Israel, have militarized our police in the name of the war on drugs and now the war on terror. The counterinsurgency-like tactics Israel uses on unarmed Palestinians are replicated in Baltimore, Oakland, Charlotte, St. Louis, and many other cities. The corporate state, like the Israeli apartheid state, seeks to make Palestinians of us all. Thanks for joining us. You can find us on rt.com slash oncontact. Until next week.